distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to today's Indoor Professorship Public Lecture. Please would like to invite our Professor Douglas Kerr, Dean of Arts, to come up to the stage to say a few words. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> the endowed professorships scheme began in 2005, <clears throat> and to date, a total of 80 of these professorships have been established at Hong Kong University. Each one of them instantiates a partnership between Hong Kong U and its friends and benefactors. Each one works for the mutual benefit of the university and the community. The community shows its support for the university. The university, in turn, shares the knowledge it creates with the community. Our speaker today, the Honyin and Sutfong Chan Professor in Chinese, Xi Shumei, <coughs> is one of the leading scholars and theorists of modern Chinese literature and culture. And she's the inaugurator of the field of Sinophone studies. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we scholars are explorers and we all aspire to make important discoveries. But Xi Shumei is one of those few who have actually redrawn the map of a field of study. <clears throat> um, it is fitting that she's the author of Sinophone Studies, a critical reader, which is the standard textbook in Sinophone Studies. Her many other Influential publications include The Lure of the Modern, Writing Modernism in Semi-Colonial China, Visuality and Identity, Sinophone Articulations Across the Pacific, and The Creolization of Theory. She's currently working on two monographs entitled Empires of the Sinophone and From World History to World Literature. And it is, as you can see from the latter book, that today's lecture will be drawn. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor to pay tribute this evening to Mr. Anthony Chan. Mr. Chan has not only served as a court member of the university, but he's also been involved in the endowed professorship scheme from the very beginning. He set up the Honyin and Sutfong Chan professorship in Chinese in 2005, in honor of his parents. We are extremely grateful for his support and generosity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kerr. Please remain on stage for a few moments more. As a token of appreciation, the university would like to present a certificate of appreciation for Mr. Anthony Chen, donor of the Hong Yin and Sip Gong Chen Professorship in Chinese. Mr. Chen, please.
going to start this evening's lecture entitled From World History to World Literature, China, the South, and the Global Sixties to be delivered by Professor Shi Shumei. Professor Shi, please. Well, thank you everyone for uh, joining uh, me in this inaugural lecture. <laughs> I'm, of course, extremely uh, honored and flattered uh, to be the uh, recipient of the professorship. Um, and I'm very grateful to Mr. Anthony Chang and family who are here to honor the occasion uh, and also to listen to a rather boring lecture. <laughs> uh, so I apologize in advance. And uh, if uh, you know, there are moments where, uh, where uh, you know, um, you know, as we academics often do, you know, we bore our audiences to death sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, then please just, you know, excuse me or just phase out, <laughs> um, which is quite fine with me. We, we will have some time for a Q&A uh, at the end, and, and hopefully uh, there will be time to invite you and some of you or many of you to uh, engage with my lecture. So, um, so, um, I, only, I recently learned that the uh, School of Chinese at its formal establishment uh, actually received donations from uh, the Straits Chinese from Southeast Asia. Uh, in my teaching here, I teach you know, one course in Center for Literature, which includes uh, Center for Literature from Southeast Asia and you know, other parts of the world. And I'm often asked by my students, why do you teach Southeast Asia in the School of Chinese? So now I can tell them uh, the reason why, that actually um, I have begun to work more on Southeast Asia, and in today's lecture I'll be able to uh, uh, include, uh, include a bit of that uh, in, my, in my talk. So I will read my paper, but you know, uh, we'll see how this goes. Okay. The pressures of contemporary globalization on scholarship are perhaps most notable in the expansion of its scope and the new awareness of the variation in scale, which in turn have generated new fields of inquiry. From economics of globalization, we have transnational studies that looks at transnational migration as a sociological category, as well as humanistic analysis of transnational cultures. Diaspora studies that examines dispersions of peoples and cultures across the world. Empire studies, which lately has become very popular in the US, um, and one wonders why. Uh, they cover large areas of the world's lands and seas over several thousand years. And world history uh, that looks at enti the entire world as an integrated and interconnected economic system. The concept of world literature, uh, coined by Goethe in the uh, early 19th century with the inventive German term world literature, uh, had been largely dominant, uh, I mean dormant, uh, for about two centuries in the humanistic fields until the recent decades and its new effervescence, now coalescing into a field uh, unto itself, is also clearly part and parcel uh, to the urge to be more expansive in the era of perceived globalization. You know, we scholars also need to respond, right, to you know, these forces uh, and conditions of globalization. I might even add that the rise of world literature or world studies, such as world history, world cinema, world music and world art in the United States may not be innocent of the contemporary conditions of American empire. Alongside the false demise of area studies that ostensibly served the American empire, uh, especially in terms of its military and strategic interest during the Cold War and after, and some of you might know that area studies was actually uh, uh, created by the uh, predecessor to the C uh, CIA, by the uh, Office of Strategic Research. World studies promises to provide a more complete picture, or at least cover more areas of the world in the post-Cold War era. In this context, how, do, how, do we, how not to do world studies in the service of the American empire is the first precaution one must take in any new thinking on world literature. All recent theories of world literature have had to do with a new awareness of scope and scale, scope in terms of inclusiveness of larger areas of the world uh, than the so-called West or Euro-America, and scale in terms of how a literary scholar uh, whose rice bowl used to be the close analysis of texts 
must learn to zoom in and zoom out of the texts, and multiple texts at that, uh, by bringing in larger matrices of understanding. Um, some of the colleagues in the Department of Comparative Literature may see that the problem is especially acute in the discipline of comparative literature, uh, because uh, uh, comparatives are the ones who are supposed to work with literary texts from multiple traditions and in multiple languages. Traditional comparative literature had been about comparing texts among European literatures, such as between German and French. And world literature, uh, I don't know whether some of you are uh, familiar with this, these conversations that have taken place uh, mainly in the United States, um, is that world literature used to be about everything else but the West, right? So as if the world did not include the West. Um, and comparative literature was about uh, the West, and not about the rest of the world, used to be. And so now the corrective is uh, to basically include the world in world literature, uh, include the West in world literature, and to include the non-West in comparative literature, right? But in either cases, uh, the West is the invisible or visible, but equally perennial referent. We now realize that non-West deserves our comparative attention, as less and leader, less readers are interested in reading comparisons between German and French texts. And, and with uh, world literature, we now realize that the West is a lost part of the world, no matter how transcendent or exceptional it may wish to be. Be that as it may, uh, both efforts, in my view, uh, have only achieved immediate success, or, or to put it rather unkindly, in my view, uh, pretty much failed. In this paper, I offer a uh, modest proposal for a new method of comparison, which I have been calling relational comparison. And using this method, I propose a new way of conceptualizing world literature. Currently, uh, there are three different uh, most, or most popular models of world literature. Um, uh, those of you who have been following this, um, you might know that uh, you know these three big names that you know most people talk about. And the first model, I call it the consecration by Paris model. Uh, I don't know whether um, uh, this this uh, this was proposed by a student of the French sociologist uh, Pierre Bourdieu. Her name is Pascal Casanova, and uh, in her book, The War Republic of Letters. She uh, tries to include discussions of Francophone literature written by ex-colonized peoples of the French Empire and uh, announces how it has finally arrived at the center of the world, uh, at the center of the World Republic of, Ellen, uh, of Letters. The center, of course, happens to be Paris. Uh, the text of Francophone writers through the consecration by Paris acquire worldwide significance. So despite uh, her, the gesture towards inclusiveness, an attempt to reach out to the other, her model here is worse than Eurocentric in that it is Paris-centric. The second model, I call it the circulation model, uh, uh, which is proposed by uh, David Demrosh, who currently runs a World Literature Institute, which is coming to Hong Kong this summer. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I forget in which university the World Literature Institute is happening, at the Chinese University, perhaps? Um, somebody might know, but CDU, at CDU. So if you're interested in the World Literature Institute uh, that's coming to Hong Kong, coming to a university near you, uh, that's a model proposed by David Demrosh, who defines world literature as literary texts that have circulated beyond their culture of origin through various modes of circulation, such as translation, publication, and reading. But the fact of the matter is that a text's privilege and chance of circulating beyond its immediate cultural context is not something that is equally available to all. And this model tends to valorize those with access to circulation. So let's think about Hong Kong literature that does not circulate beyond Hong Kong very easily. Then does that mean Hong Kong literature cannot be part of world literature, right? So the circulation model is very problematic. And the third model, I call it the distant, distant reading model. So this is uh, proposed by a literary sociologist, um, uh, Franco Moretti, who teaches at Stanford. 
and, and he, uh, he says that uh, there's so many texts written in the world, published and written in the world. How can we ever read them all? We simply cannot. And so he says, instead of close reading, which used to be you know, what we were taught to do as students, and we continue to teach now to our students, so we read a text closely, right? Uh, instead of close reading, he says, let's do distant reading. You know, we have to do graphing and other kinds of sort of quantitative uh, uh, ways of, you know, categorizing and understanding such as, you know, uh, explaining such phenomena as the rise of the novel and so forth. Uh, but uh, my very uh, sort of uh, reductive and unkind reading of the distant reading model is to say that, you know, let's just pile all the books over there and just read them from here. <laughs> um, and I don't, I don't know what that does to literature. You know, some of us, I think, went into this field thinking we really like what we read. <laughs> you know, and th that actually means turning the pages, reading the words, you know, and really actually doing close reading. And so that's been rather disheartening. As opposed to models of world literature, models of world history seem to have fared better. I know we have some historians here, but I'm not putting you on the spot. Um, I'll be curious to hear how historians would respond to my talk. Um, especially referring to what came after Emmanuel Wallerstein's world system theory in the work of those historians who critique the assumed European exceptionalism of, of world system theory. The notion that the rise of the West in the 16th century coincided with the formation of a world economic system. And these um, uh, anti euro century world historians sometimes uh, call their work um, integrative world history. The two main theses, as far as I understand, for uh, integrated world history historians are that the world as we know it has been integrated economically and otherwise for much longer than the modern world system theory proposes and that the so-called rise of the West owe much to the more advanced East, which includes the Middle East and the Far East. For some of these historians, uh, to consider the macro history of the world is to learn the interconnectedness of the world since at least around the 6th century. And what this means is that the ideology of East is East and West is West is as fictive as it is false. Historical sociologist Janet Abu Lugot uh, identifies the existence of a polycentric world system in the 13th century, much before the European led world system of the 16th century, suggested by Wallerstein. Uh, Andrew Gunder Frank charts the interconnectedness and simultaneity in world events to show Asian wealth and power from around 1400 to 1800 to dispute the European exceptionalism of the world system theory. Uh, Frank, along with Barry Gills, would even consider that an integrated world economic system can be traced back by 5,000 years. Uh, John and M. Hobson, in a tellingly titled book, The Eastern Origin of Western Civilization, extends the arguments about further to say that the so-called rise of the West was crucially to the resource portfolios from the East, especially China, which include technologies, institutions, and ideas such as gunpowder, printing, navigational sciences, the creation of capitalist institutions, advancement in astronomy and mathematics, and the enlightened ideas of rationality. And after you know, I read this list, uh, then I wonder what's left for the West to <laughs> have invented, created, produced. Nothing's left. Everything was done by the East. Historian Miko Siegel uh, sums up succinctly what she considers to be the major emphasis of this type of world history as, quote, the complex global network of power inflected relations that enmesh our world. This is a key phrase in this piece, and so I'll repeat it one more time. The complex global network um, of power inflected relations that enmesh our world. To be sure, not all parts of the network are equally affecting or, or uh, evenly affected by the global system. But all parts of the network are constitutive of the system itself. And there is no hiding from an interconnectedness that is, that is thoroughly infiltrated by the operations of power. This means that histories of empire, conquest, slavery, colonialism, 
and other forms of domination cannot in any way be disavowed when one does world history. After all, another key phrase for me is that power is a form of relation. To analogize for the moment, I would like to propose a conception of world literature where literary texts are enmeshed in a complex global network of power-inflected relations. However, it is not analogy that I'm after, but relation. World history and world literature are conjunctural formations intimately connected to each other. In very commonsensical uh, way, uh, world literature happens in world history, right? And world history includes world literature. I know it's very simple. Uh, however, uh, so far scholars of world literature have not said this very, made this very simple statement, and so gives me an opportunity to make it. <laughs> world literature and world history are enmeshed in complex relations, not mere parallels, analogies, or subjects and objects of influence. Their relationship, I posit, is more phenomenological than conceptual, though it took a conceptual maneuver for me to get to this point. The key word here for me is relation. And I partly draw from the work of Caribbean thinker, Edouard Glissant, specifically his notion of relation, with the capital R, or relation. It's itself inspired by chaos theory, as well as contemporary movements of globalization. For Glissant, relation is both a way of describing and understanding the globalized world of infinite interaction of cultures on the one hand, and as an act, he says relation is a verb. Uh, that changes all the elements that come into relation with each other. Relation is therefore much of, uh, as much a phenomenological description of the world as a movement or a process. As a description, it is akin to the perception of the dynamics of the world in chaos theory. As a movement, it is best exemplified in the worldwide and ceaseless process of, of creolization. It is a description of the dynamics in the world a way of looking at the world, a way of being for a person or a text in the world, and as a ver verb, I would infer, a way to do research as a scholar. This relational way of doing research on world literature in the context of world history is what I call relational comparison. So how can we do this? Um, simply put, doing relational studies means setting into motion relationalities between entities brought together for comparison and bringing into relation terms that have been traditionally pushed apart from each other due to certain interests. I consider the excavation of these relationalities to be the ethical practice of comparison, where marginalized texts from so-called peripheries or semi-peripheries and here I'm using the language of the world system theory, can be equally brought to relations as can canonical texts. The work of the comparatist thereby partially equalizes the, terrain, the uneven terrain of literatures across the world, whether in circulation or representation. Relational comparison thus breaks up the center periphery model of the world system theory as the texts form a network of relations wherever the texts are written, read, and circulated. Hence, any given text can be potentially brought into relation. Since these relations can manifest themselves on the formal, generic, and other levels, so the task necessitates not only sensitivity to world history, but also close readings of the texts. So you scale back both the global and the text textual without losing sight of either of the scales. As much as the texts are beings in the world, there are also singular aesthetic objects that require attentive readings. In its interconnectedness in history and singularity as text, we may say, lie a literary work's worldliness and literariness. Between the world and the text, there is the crucial question of scale for the comparatist. And the proposal here for close readings of text in the context of world history allows for the scaling back and forth between the world and the text as well as along the inter intermediary scales, moving towards a more integrated conception of world literature, where the issue is not inclusiveness or qualification, which text deserves to be uh, 
studied or designated as war literature and which is not, etc., but excavating and activating the historically specific set of relationalities across time and space. In this way, the poetics of the world, uh, the patterns of world history, may be intimately connected to the poetics of the text, the formal arrangements of the text. We do not have to give up either one of the scales. <laughs> Patrick Manning, a global historian, offers some practical advice on the task of the world historian to start, he says. Selecting a geographical scale, a time period, and a topic of focus, which we may take as a useful starting point for, for, a, for a, a war literature scholar as well. Since all encompassing global synthesis, as proposed by integrated war historians, is practically, impo practically impossible to achieve, however, I'm inclined to take a much less totalistic view. Both the system theorists or their anti-Eurocentric critics have been charged rightly for their totalistic tendencies, which can never be um, can never be held up to be empirically true. Herein lies lies one of the major limits of integrated world history. Rather than aiming for global synthesis, I therefore proposed a notion of a literary arc that links multiple nodes along it, but its trajectory is incomplete, unpredictable and it does not form a closed circle. A text can enter into relations with the other texts anywhere along the arc, illuminating issues at hand, presented within a specific geographical scale in a time period or across time periods. A recent correct corrective to the totalizing impulse of world history is the approach called connected histories, which equally emphasizes the cultural and ideological interactions among different parts of the world, but the unit of analysis in Nova is no longer the entire world. Sanjay Subramanian illustrates this in terms of the interconnected connection among some, some of, not all of, uh, early modern empires arguing that early modern empires such as the Qing, Mughal, Ottoman, and Russian empires were competing and intertwined as they borrowed, quote, symbols, ideas, and institutions, unquote, from each other. The diachronic transfer of imperial models and notions, Translatio and Perry, was therefore also synchronic. Jane Burbank and Frederick Cooper in Empires in World History also argue that empires existed in relation to each other. Looking for connections, one historian looks at the cultural links between Latin America and the Arab world through Moorish Spain, while a few historians have looked at the interconnectedness of the Indian Ocean, such as the interactions among peoples from the lands that ring the Indian Ocean that often extend beyond, farther, uh, even beyond, uh, even farther beyond the rim. Like connected histories, which does not presume to provide a complete synthesis of world history, the notion of the literary arc as a way to connect texts, spaces, events, and issues across a specific trajectory in, the world, in world history does not aim for totality. So the second problem with, uh, so the first problem with integrated world history is that they tend to be totalistic and cannot be held up empirically. <laughs> the second problem is that um, uh, its anti-Eurocentrism actually unwittingly helps consolidate a new albeit a different center, and a comparatist with an Asian, as a comparatist with an Asian background, I find this problem to be especially acute. An unintended consequence of anti-Eurocentric world history is that in its valorization, indeed over-valorization, of the civilizational and technological contributions made by Asia, especially China, consider gunpowder paper compass, it can serve unwittingly as an apology or justification for the rise of China in the contemporary world. Perhaps not so paradoxically, anti-Eurocentric history in its zeal to dispute European exceptionalism ends up constructing another alternative center. The difficulty, of course, is that China is by no means an unproblematic alternative to Eurocentrism. It appears that from the days when China had been supposed to belong to the revolutionary third world, to the current perception of China as a neo-colonial presence in Africa and Southeast Asia took only a few decades to complete, actually very few decades to complete. Chinese intellectuals, not so unexpectedly then, have been self-consciously utilizing such anti-Eurocentric historiography to make several arguments. 
One, China has been an important, if not the most important, contributor to world civilization. Two, the era of Western hegemony is over and the rise of China is inevitable. Three, China will be at the center of the new world order. They draw two major supports from this uh, historiography. The existence of the tribute system uh, since time immemorial, um, and in this regard, the work of um, uh, Takeshi Hamashita and, uh, and Giovanni Arigi, you know, have been very uh, important here. The idea that this, and, and so that's one, is the tribute system. And the, other, and the other one is the idea that the state form of China exceeds the Westphalian system of sovereign nation state, and that it should be considered a civilization state. How the new perception of China's importance in world civilizations led to a confident and proud self-perception within China can be found in the reemergence of the imperial discourse of all under heaven, Tianxia, in contemporary China. Traditionally, the concept was cosmological come political, involving the emperor in the center as the son of heaven, who, with the mandate of heaven, rules over the realm under heaven, Tianxia. Tianxia, as a political cosmology, evinces a con con concentric structure of power with the Son of Heaven at the center or apex, emanating its dominion over inner subjects, outer subjects, tributary states, and barbarians in all four uh, directions of north, south, east, and west, which belong to outside lands, or more literally, the realm beyond civilization. Within this political structure, all those beyond the center proper constitute different barbarian peoples. Um, people all know these terminologies. The southern back there, Naman Beiti, Dong Yi there are all different kinds of barbarians, and their names uh, carry, uh, red, red parts of characters carry implications of beastliness and so forth. Um, only in the 20th century, the names for these frontier or minority peoples in China began losing their own names with references to beastliness. Um, in other words, the concept of all under heaven has been historically imbued within it the barbarization and primitivization of the other, revealing the deeply seated Chinese racial unconscious. The concept undergoes a radical rejuvenation in the work of Zhao Tingyang, who is a professor of philosophy at People's University in Beijing, and who has made the concept very popular. All under heaven, Zhao proposes, is an acceptable empire. Um, it's an acceptable empire form uh, that is also an ideal form of empire, or a perfect empire. Commenting on democracy, he argues that the system of all under heaven is superior to democracy because democracy, quote, represents misled minds much more than the independent, the false want much more than true needs, and elusive advantages much more than real goods and virtues, unquote. As history has shown, he contends, quote, the masses always make the wrong choices for themselves through a misled democracy, unquote. He continues that now as a major economic power, China also must become, quote, a major nation for the production of knowledge, unquote. China can do so by creating new ideas of the world and a new world system. This is a project of rethinking China so that Chinese knowledge becomes an important basis for the world knowledge system. Since China is a major part of the world, thinking about China must develop into thinking about the world, and thus, uh, quote, the fundamental uh, goal of rethinking China is rethinking the world, unquote. Uh, here, through a series of rhetor rhetorical substitutions, China has somehow become the world. The rise of China gives substance and cause to the rise of the discourse of all under heaven. And the discourse, in fact, justifies the complete denigration of socialist values, even as China presumes itself to be putatively socialist. Such socialist values as autonomy of national minorities are daily tested, and the global solidarity of people of color around the world is largely abandoned by Chinese extractionist policies in Africa, and 
and Chinese-led development in Southeast Asia. And it is in this context that we need to take a careful retrospective look back at the so-called Global 60s, broadly defined to include the period from 1950s to 1970s, a la Christian Ross, to reconsider our understanding of that event and moment, uh, especially China's role within it. Here I offer a reading of a relational arc of minor and less discussed texts that review for us some of the perspectives suppressed by the revolutionary ferment of the global 60s. I argue below that a critical perspective on the global 60s from the South will review a very different understanding of Chinese participation in the revolutionary era. The tests of the comparatist informed of world history then also includes challenging some of our deep ideological pieties and time-honored narratives. Against the lure of the new economy of culture, where Eurocentrism proposed cure has turned out to be Chinocentrism, literary scholars perhaps bear new responsibilities. Responsibility in this context, it seems, is to make an effort to cultivate the capacity to respond to changing historical configurations of power, which also means to take the necessary retrospective look uh, back at history anew. For scholars who work on China, this means not to be content to benefit from the China versus the West binarism, but to critique it, unsettle it, and to move beyond it as a matter of ethical practice. Responsibility in this context then requires new engagements with otherness, both old and new forms of otherness that have either been historically there or are newly produced by the dominant uh, binarism. Perhaps no other event cr crystallized the global 60s revolutionary and decolonial ferment than the Bandung Conference of 1955, when 25 Asian and African countries gathered in Bandung, Indonesia, to establish a global anti-colonial alliance and Afro-Asian solidarity. That China was part of the decolonizing world at the time was beyond dispute. Hence, it comes as a bit of surprise uh, when we read the report on the conference uh, by the African-American writer, Richard Wright. Richard Wright was at this time, uh, he left the US and uh, became permanent resident in Paris. And he uh, went to Bandung on his own because Americans were not allowed to participate. And uh, he went more like a journalist. And uh, he's, uh, he uh, then wrote a book uh, that came out the following year called uh, The Color Curtain, a report on the Bandung <coughs> Conference. The book begins with the exaltation that the conference is where the colored people of the world, the despised, the insulted, the hurt, the dispossessed, in short, the underdogs of the human race, got together. Having been a supporter of negritude and pan-Africanism, Richard Wright's involvement in Afro-Asian solidarity was a historically significant event in, in that the colored people now are not just like black, right? They're also brown and yellow. At the conference, uh, he therefore paid special attention to the speech by the Chinese Premier, uh, Zhou Enlai. In 1955, the People's Republic of China was barely uh, six years old, having finally achieved full autonomy from Western and Japanese incursions and successfully defeated the Kuomintang. Richard Wright makes uh, what to some a surprising and to others uh, a prescient observation, he says. Here was, a, uh, here was a chance for China to surround herself with men and nations uh, who had suffered at the hands of the colony-owning Western states. And since the United States had not disavowed its uh, support of such states, China then could walk as a fellow guest into an anti-Western house built by a reaction to colonialism and racialism. It was a gift from the skies. Cornel West, another uh, a contemporary African-American thinker today, Cornel West would later add that Zhou Enlai was making, quote, masterful moves to gain legitimacy for the People's Republic of China among resistant Third World nations. By this time, disillusionment with Stalinism was widespread, and Wright notes how, uh, uh, Richard Wright notes how Zhou masterfully avoided the baiting by those attacking the Soviet Union and separated China from the Soviet Union. Communism at Bandung uh, was thus, quote, 
conspicuous for its shyness, its coyness, its bland smile, smile and glad hand for everyone." Unquote. Zhou Enlai's clever separation of China from the Soviet Union foreshadows the eventual Sino-Soviet split in the early 1960s. By then, China has successfully positioned itself as a leader of the revolutionary third world. Even though it was a communist country, in the context of the Cold War, it was invited as an observer in the non-aligned movement. How China became part of the third world, not aligned, not the communist bloc of the second world in general understanding, itself deserves a lengthy analysis. Suffice it to say that the second world and the third world designations, whether uh, in Mao's uh, three worlds theory or Western theories of three worlds, were not just based on differential modes of production. But belonging to the third world, and especially becoming a leader of the third world, was both a way to assert Chinese agency and a way to become uh, allied with the people of color of the world. I don't know how many of you have heard, heard about uh, the event in 1968 when uh, Chinese held a massive rally in, in Tiananmen Square to protest against the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. These events and choices have had profound consequences for academic scholarship on China in the United States, uh, such that China, instead of becoming the object of Cold War studies, could become the object of post-colonial studies, especially in the 1980s and 1990s. China was the object of empire and the leader of the third world, hence naturally considered part of the global south. If you look at maps of global south, uh, and Global North designations right now, China is still the Global South. Recall, for instance, um, those of you in literary studies, uh, you know this famous or infamous article by Frederick Jemison uh, that is called Third World Literature in the Era of Multinational Capitalism, uh, where the quintessential third world was represented by China. And that article came out in 1986. Um, but the views from places geographically and symbolically south to China can be quite different during and after the global 60s. As we know, also present at the Bandung Conference was Ho Chi Minh, representing the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, and at, 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 a time, at the time a close uh, ally of China, which provided both revolutionary know-how as well as economic and military aid. What is less well known, however, uh, perhaps, is that in the year of the Bandung Conference, uh, Northern Vietnam was embroiled in the land reform campaign, uh, cons consciously modeled after that of China, where struggles against landlord classes led to a total death toll of about half a million, and about which even the Vietnamese state later admitted that up to 70% of those accused were wrongly classified. The young female protagonist in Vietnamese writer Dong Tu Hung's novel, Paradise of the Blind, was born too late uh, to witness the land reform, which has caused great pain in her family. Her maternal uncle, who is a party cadre, helped cause the death of her, her own father, as well as the loss of her family's meager wealth due to misclassification. From her, from her mother and her aunt's witness accounts, she hears about how revolution created revolutionary opportunists, such as local thugs who became elevated to the rank of pillars of the peasantry and the pillars of the land reform, and who felt no compunction about engaging in acts of violence. The traumas of Maoist extremism that her aunt and her mother experienced now becomes mixed into their love towards her, a complex condensation of psychological processes of displacement, sublimation, and compensation. Confronting her aunt's love, she re reflects. I saw it in the looks she gave me, in her abrupt, excessive tenderness in her voice, and it scared me. Perhaps I was too young to be the object of such love. Somehow it seemed abnormal, too violent, too implacable. As the narrator goes up to be a young woman, uh, she goes to work in the Soviet Union as an exported worker. Here, world history intervenes again, now not as our protagonist's post-memory, a memory that she did not have, but as part of her lived experience. While fighting off French colonialism and American invasion, 
Vietnam also had to confront the two big brothers of the Chinese and the Soviets. Despite decades of fraternal, uh, fraternal camaraderie with Maoist China, Vietnam's relationship with China turned gradually sour after China's rapprochement with the United States and China's support for Pol Pot's Kampuchea led to Chinese invasion of Vietnam in 1979. The Vietnamese state would denounce Maoism by now as reactionary, conduct a thorough demoisization, proclaim opposition to, quote, Chinese expansionism, hegemonism, and chauvinism, and connect this recent experience with the history of Chinese invasion and colonization of Vietnam as part of what they call Great Han expansionism. After all, uh, their history book says, Vietnam was a colony of China uh, for 1,000 years from 111 BC to 938 AD. It is in this, in this uh, view, uh, not an exaggeration to say, that pre-modern history of Vietnam was punctuated by a continuous struggle against China. While Chinese historical records would call Vietnam variously as a tributary or vassal state, the official Vietnamese history records numerous uprisings and rebellions against the Chinese, and this history has direct bearings on the lives of Chinese minorities within Vietnam, the Hoa. When Zhou Enlai visited Vietnam and paid tribute to the Trump sisters who rebelled against the Chinese in the first century AD, the Chinese in Vietnam, as one historian notes, felt effectively undermined. Similarly, Zhou Enlai and Ban Dung agreed not to interfere, interfere with the internal affairs of Indonesia in terms of its treatment of its Chinese minorities, which basically meant that Indonesia had a free hand in dealing with those Chinese who at the time still had Chinese citizenship. Chinese Indonesians were targeted in riots and pogroms, especially after the 1965 September movement and throughout the 1970s. And up to 45 discriminat discriminatory laws were passed against the Chinese, culminating in the racial riot of 1998. Whether the Chinese in South Southeast Asia were themselves settler colonizers, compadors of Western colonizers, exploitative capitalists, or um, um, or whatever, uh, this abandonment by China. Um, uh, has direct relationships to the ensuing racial riots against the Chinese, not only in Indonesia, but also in Singapore and Malaysia, not to mention the massive expulsion of the Hua from Vietnam. The overseas Chinese, by Chinese designation, called for duty and loyalty towards China, then can also be strategically abandoned. I read an entire collection of Sinophone Vietnamese literature comprised of poetry, prose and short stories since the 1950s. At over 400 pages, however, there's not even one reference to the momentous and traumatic, and not to say traumatic, ideological, political, and ethnic experiences of the Hua in Vietnam. This absence is more than telling, especially since the volume was published in Singapore and could have avoided censorship in Vietnam. And now we can understand why the Chinese Vietnamese writer Du Thi Huan who dared to write about anti-Chinese sentiments in Vietnam would be driven to a mental breakdown by the, by the treatment she received uh, for her writing. The revolutionary times of the global 60s in Malaysia would equally push the Chinese Malaysians to the margins, abandoned by China, so to speak, even for those who dedicated themselves to the Chinese Communist cause through participating in the Malayan Communist Party. The Malayan Communist Party was a majority Chinese Malaysian in constitution. And fighting Maoist uh, guerrilla wars against the British and the Japanese. Uh, many who left Singapore and Malaysia for China would later be prosecuted during the Cultural Revolution as overseas spies, as were the Chinese Vietnamese who left Vietnam for China. Some of you um, might have even uh, uh, heard of the story of those Taiwanese who went to China to fight against the Japanese during the anti during the Sino-Japanese War, uh, uh, only to be prosecuted and imprisoned uh, as Japanese spies. Those Chinese Malaysian communists uh, who did not uh, repatri uh, you know go to China. I mean, they they couldn't go back to China because they've been there for generations. Uh, who stayed in Malaysia were hunted down from their hideouts in the mountains by the British, as well as the post-colonial Malay, Malay government of Malaysia. I think the last remnants 
of the Chinese Malaysian communists just came out a few years ago. Uh, they thought they were still fighting uh, for communist victory in Malaysia. Uh, so they've been home, home, you know, sort of uh, hiding out in the jungles for half a century, almost. Racial riots in Singapore in 1964 and 1968 uh, led directly to the expulsion of Singapore from Malaysia and the May 13th incident of 1969, a large-scale racial riot against the Chinese in the Kuala Lumpur area led to about 600 dead, most of whom being, as can be expected, Chinese Malaysians. The only character who mentions the May 13th incident at all in Center for Malaysian author Li Zhu's metafictional novel, Years of Farewell, was born too late to be a witness. Uh, as as was the protagonist in uh, you know, Paradise of the Blind. This protagonist, who shares the same name with two other protagonists, reads a novel within the novel that bears the same title as the novel we're reading. Both our novel and the novel within the novel begin on page 513. A few pages into the novel she was reading, she reflects on the number 513. You remember 513 used to be a taboo number. Even after many years have passed since the incident, people would lower their voices out of habit when talking about this number, using a voice that is either arrested at the throat or would rise and close to the nose. Their mysterious looks and secretive expressions have always made you feel uncomfortable. Hence, each time you opened the novel and saw the page number on the lower right, you felt a shock. The missing 512 pages referencing blankness and taboo, lack like of provocation and interrogation are a secret. 513, of course, obliquely references May 13th incident. And the novel will proceed from here exactly like a provocation, an interrogation, or a secret. And will not refer back to the incident in any explicit manner again, with the incident glaringly present as an absence. In this way, the incident becomes paradoxically the er signifier, precisely because of its absence, pointing to the impossibility of narrating it, and hence the metafictional attempts at narrating it only as absence. Some, someone in the novel tells us that the novel is like a Russian doll in its layered sameness, skillfully skirting the question of who is the real protagonist and whose stories and whose memories the author is recording or representing. In the meantime, the author offers the reader a gallery of multiple generations of Chinese Malaysian characters and makes very ironic references to major debates and issues in the history of Sinophone Malaysian literature, becoming a postmodern document of both an ethnic history and a literary history of Chinese Malaysians. The novel thus writes absence into form and content. But what if you were present at the scene? Hong Kong writer uh, Tai Yun Pei, or Tai Yan Pei, my Cantonese is pretty bad as you can imagine, so pronunciation is not good. But uh, Mandarin is Tai Yan Pei, uh, or Tai Yun Pei, uh, who was once a nominee to the Nobel Prize. Did you know that we had a Hong Kong nominee to the Nobel Prize? Uh, um, wrote several works in the year 1967, when the revolutionary ferment in China spilled over to Hong Kong and labor disputes escalated into large-scale riots. Here's the short poem called The Widow, written in the year 1967. This is a poem everybody read, written in the public with blood, and as itself is brilliant enough that the widow, as a rule, has to wear a mourning flower, thanks to the committee. So that's the poem. Who is the widow? What committee? Why we can understand different ideological positions people might take in the 1967 riots, a sustained Hong Kong perspective, whether contemporary then or retrospective, seems to take the riots with a great degree of ambiguity. We find out, for instance, that the poem commemorates not a leftist revolutionary, but a man assassinated by the leftists during the riots. We can therefore fruitfully ask the question, 
is the violence of the 1967, uh, the violence of anti-colonialism, decolonization, or something else? This is a question that comes up again and again in literary works written in 1967, as well as documentary history of the riots. There is a persistent lack of clarity as, uh, of what this violence means for Hong Kong people, caught between Chinese nationalism and British imperialism in this case, carving out an ambiguous position which in the end cannot but be non-ideological. The first person narrator in Tsai Yun Pui's another work, a short story called The Key, which is saucy. My, I've been learning this term in my Cantonese class, uh, which was um, also written in 1967 and set in the days of the riots, would therefore joke that whether it is imperialism's brandy or communism's bamboo liquor, if you mix it and drink it, you will feel equally tipsy. While his leftist friends went to join the demonstrations, our protagonist stands in front of his apartment because he has lost his key and cannot enter his apartment. He, he begs his way into his neighbor's apartment and there begins a very tepid love affair with a neighbor that leads to a marriage without conviction at the end of the story. In the meantime, the riots are over. Quote, the dusk approaches the sun, uh, the dusk approaches the dawn, the golden moon like a boat floats on the other side of the sea. Some islands appear, some willow trees appear, some flowers appear. A bird flies far, far away, disappearing into the endless blue." Unquote. Hong Kong scholar and poet Liu Wai Tong, uh, Liu Wai Tong argues that uh, Tsai Yun Pui, like many other Hong Kong writers, has articulated an anti-colonial position that is not stereotypically leftist precisely because the left is associated with Chinese nationalism to which Hong Kongers have an ambivalent relationship. This is the crux of the problem that our conventional understanding of the decolonial 1960s is completely unable to account for, exchanging the fractured terrain of the global 60s for a simplified ideological reading. Why has the end of the May 68 in Paris gradually led to the waning of Marxism in France? especially in its intellectual discourse, also speaks to this ambiguity. Seen in this light, Hong Kong 60s may be more paradigmatic of what was happening in the world than otherwise thought, as I hope I've shown was the case in Vietnam and Malaysia. The views from the South register differential positions to the Chinese North, and these views clamor for rethinking and reinterpreting the global 60s, which did draw freely from Maoism. Kenyan write, writer Ngugi Wathiongo said to me personally, in person, that uh, Kenyans embraced Maoism not because of its theoretical and practical usefulness, but because it was, quote, a non-white version of Marxism. <laughs> the global 60s arc that I trace here, connecting Indonesia, China, Vietnam, Malaysia, and Hong is inflected by China's deft appropriation of the global anti-colonial line and the strategic thermodization of China. Our lingering romanticism towards the global 60s needs to be radically rethought via a scrupulous excavation of suppressed relationalities, in this case, between the South and the North as actual and symbolic geographies. It seems that neither Eurocentric nor anti-Eurocentric world history foresaw the rise of China and how this rise must compel us to recalibrate historical and literary relationalities anew. Such may be our task as world literature scholars at this historical conjuncture. And that is our responsibility so that we may do justice to the complex network of power and inflective relations and that enmesh our world. Thank you so much. for giving us such a wonderful and stimulating talk. I certainly learned a lot.
Today is actually a very special day, April the 15th, because earlier during the tea reception, I was reminded by a Department of History colleague that today is actually the 25th death anniversary of Hu Yaobang. So it was a very, very interesting coincidence to be talking about world history and world literature, especially during the 1960s. So uh, I found uh, Shumei's talk very, very, very stimulating because uh, it not only reconceptualizes the very notion of world literature, but also invites us to rethink the word relation as a verb, not as a noun. So um, without further ado, we would like now to proceed with the Q&A session. We should have uh, two helpers. Uh, they are toward the back of the lecture theater. They're dressing in the, um, the helpers uh, attire in the green gown. Uh, so please wait till the microphone has reached you before you start asking questions. And we would appreciate if you can keep your questions as concise as possible. And we would like to invite a couple of questions and Professor Shu will answer them all together and then we will open up for another round of questions. So, okay, um, now the floor is open. So, anyone who would like to ask questions? Whoever will ask a question will not be the only person asking, so yeah. it's quite okay. Uh, and then we really appreciate feedback and comments. And, uh, and so we'll collect a few questions and then uh, uh, and we do have quite a few on. literary scholars and historians in the audience. Okay. Anybody who would like to start? <laughs> okay, yes, please. Oh. <laughs> Professor Xi, thanks again for the lecture. Um, I would like to ask. Can xylophone studies go beyond, um, I mean, literature? Of course, you have applied uh, the concept in analyzing some uh, visual arts. How about, can it be looked at um, in relations between people, as in more bodily interactions? Because you know the conflicts between people are really apparent, where people are in contact with each other, and conflicts of language comes in face to face, and whether these sinophone studies can be looked at in a more everyday life practices. Thank you for the question. I'm collecting questions. I'm waiting. Yeah. Can we have the second question, please? Um, uh, we, we know that um, China becoming a global power, a global influence is what happened up, after uh, Deng Xiaoping's uh, open door policy. And uh, Professor Xi is uh, mainly focusing on the 60s. But uh, our understanding of the 60s is, is that actually China is actually closing its door uh, from the rest of the world and uh, busy with uh, cultural revolution and uh, the kind of uh, reform, I mean, in I mean, so, so uh, I mean, the, the, the notion of global, right, uh, suggesting uh, uh, some sort of connection with the world and may, may not be um, um, uh, uh, what we say, may, may, may be different from, from our, our understanding. Right? And, and also, uh, Global South, I, because I, I participated in David Demos, um, a world literature uh, course in Turkey and also in Beijing before, um, when, when they are talking about Global South and then they, they are not uh, referring to China, right? or, or uh, uh, they, they are actually talking about, uh, uh, about America, right? it was the South. So, so I, I, I don't know what, what uh, your notion of Global South in the 60s, whether you have uh, some specific uh, meaning, um, whether Global South is global or, or not global. Uh, or um, whether uh, if China closes its door uh, to the rest of the world, and how, how can it be global I mean, in, in the 60s? So, so these are uh, my questions. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, uh, the gentleman with the cap. Oh, I'm a Hong Kong alumnus. 
Uh, anyway, my question is, um, China obviously has been trying to increase its uh, soft power, right, uh, in recent years, uh, in literature and as well. And uh, the fact that uh, China got its first, uh, Mo Yan got its first uh, Nobel Literature Prize is a testament to that. Uh, but China, in the Chinese literature, has been in the wilderness for many years until recently. So I'm just wondering whether this is a late recognition by the world of uh, China's uh, literary achievement, or was it more mo uh, politically uh, motivated? Is it because China is now big, strong, you know? So, uh, well, I mean, uh, let, let's give them a, a prize, you know, okay? Uh, <laughs> Jeff's already got it some years ago, many years ago, so it's about time that China got it. So uh, it's a kind of rebalancing, right, in, in the literary sense. But uh, do you also, my, my, rela uh, my related question is, uh, do you also see uh, possibilities in, uh, that uh, Taiwan, uh, Hong Kong, or Southeast Asia, Chinese writers, uh, literature figures, will have a chance to get the uh, Nobel Prize? You know, what's your prediction? You know? Thank you. <laughs> Sinophone literature as theory, 
uh, and as means of intervening major theoretical debates in Western Academy. As you know, I'm freshly from the Western Academy, and so my interventions, as you might have also read and uh, heard in my, in my lecture today, are very much conversations you know, I have been having right, uh, in, in, with uh, academics in, uh, in the US and Europe. And, uh, and one of the ways in which Sinophone theory can also work is through what I, have, what I have written about as what I call conjunctive method, uh, which is you bring two different discourses, two different conversations together um, as, as, as a con using the conjunction end. So let's say, uh, in this case that I was writing about, is xenophone studies and queer studies. And how xenophone studies and queer studies share uh, certain similarities, and by putting them together using the conjunctive end, you actually bring forward all sorts of dynamics and interesting uh, problems. And uh, I find that kind of conjunctive method very uh, productive. And so, you know, I can, maybe in your case, it will be dance studies and uh, xenophone studies. In what ways in which, uh, by putting them next to each other, using the conjunctive end, uh, that, you, uh, that you generate uh, some observations and ideas that, that otherwise would not be there. And in terms of global 60s and the questioning of the term global, uh, thank you for that question. Um, global 60s is a term uh, that, uh, that in the U.S. context, widely used to describe the worldwide decolonial and anti-colonial movements around the world, and uh, and so the term is almost like a uh, proper noun, you know, and uh, it references uh, those movements around the world, especially in Africa, Latin America, and Asia, and 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 so here, I, I think I understand uh, where you are coming from because. Uh, it seems, you know, when we say global, oftentimes it's a shorthand of saying Western. So you're not global until you, you're saying something about the West or connected to the West and so forth. But Global 60s was really about a, uh, about a different notion of the global, right? We're talking about Latin America, Asia, and Africa. And China played a major role uh, in those global 60s. Um, you know, uh, 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 Mao helped build a Freedom Railroad, right, in Africa, right? Uh, that is their Freedom Railroad, like ours in the United States. And, uh, and uh, Joe and I visited Africa 10 times, uh, started offering uh, African students to come and uh, to, uh, study in China since 1961. Um, and, and that has lasted um, you know, all these years. So what is global? Is Chinese-African relationship not global? You know, or, and Chinese-US relationship is global, right? So it's also, I think, a way of thinking about the global in very different, different ways. Uh, but but uh, Chinese sort of Sino-African relations, of course, right now is one of the hottest topics I know in political science. And some of us literary scholars, we kind of want to uh, 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 partake in this uh, conversation uh, as well, but but in terms of uh, global 60s uh, Chinese relationship to various African countries, you know, in, in terms of uh, Chinese uh, sort of, um, I mean, as opposed to the idea of the closed door, actually, remember, China joined the United Nations in 1971, and crucially for China, it got 26 African votes. Without those African votes, China could not have joined uh, the United Nations. Very important. China's got those votes in Bandung, right? And China got those 26 African votes. But that's global. That's a lot of countries. So that's my, uh, um, my answer or response to that question. And in terms of soft power, um, in connection to uh, so-called overseas Chinese studies and Chinese diaspora studies, is that one of the rising discourses about the Chinese diaspora within China is that actually we should use the Chinese diaspora to spread our soft power, right? So uh, it's been a very interesting, um, I think the overseas Chinese Hua Chao category has always been called to duty and loyalty, right, towards China, right? They were the mothers of Chinese revolution, right? Um, you know, they donated all the money, Hong Kongers and Southeast Asian Chinese, they donated the money to Sun Yat-sen, right? Sun Yat-sen was here, 
um, uh, and, and in Hawaii and so forth, and uh, aided in the uh, Republican Revolution of 1911 uh, financially. Um, but uh, that's sort of, uh, I just wanted to bring that in in terms of uh, how the, uh, how, how the sort of the um, official uh, uh, position on the so-called Chinese diaspora, you know, uh, comes with all these strings attached. And this is uh, one of the things that I critique in my work and in a piece that I published and the title of the piece is called Against Diaspora. And, um, and I, I think uh, a lot of people felt, because the Expert Studies is also kind of popular, you know, fashionable uh, in the US, in the humanities, and so uh, and also in some sociology. And so I think they were um, miffed, actually, the journal editor of the journal called Diaspora, you know the journal called Diaspora, uh, edited by Kachi Taloyan. And Kachi actually was upset that I uh, wrote a piece called Against Diaspora, which is anthologized many, many times in different, different volumes, and he's very upset about it. Anyway, so, so that's a, 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 a side remark, only because I feel quite uh, passionate about it. But in terms of uh, soft power and Nobel Prize, um, you know, Nobel Prize is really about politics of recognition, and politics of recognition works in, uh, you know, the mechanism of the politics of recognition, you know, is as various, and I, I have also uh, written about this, and especially in relation to the uh, to the uh, event of Gao Xingjin winning the Nobel Prize, and uh, the French side basically saying he's a Chinese writer, right? Even though his citizenship was French, right? And then the Chinese side saying he's not Chinese because he's opposed to China, <laughs> right? He criticizes China, and so. And so the question of you know uh, language, because actually Gao Jingjian now writes uh, a lot in French, right? So he's both Sinophone and Francophone. And so the question of language and which language belongs to whom, who owns the language, and relation between language and nationality, and all of these are basically needing to be disaggregated uh, for us to understand more. I think uh, more um, uh, on the ground exactly how people are living, thinking, writing. Uh, Stuart Hall was once asked this question. He says, um, uh, actually, uh, Stuart Hall just passed away, right? And uh, there's a nice video on YouTube called the Stuart Hall Project. Stuart Hall is a Birmingham School of Cultural Studies uh, um, black British thinker. Um, many of us follow his work um, you know, in our careers. And, and, and he says that uh, today, if I am asked uh, a question, where you are from, he says, no, he says, today, if anyone is asked the question, where you are from, I expect the answer to be very long. <laughs> <laughs> I think that really captures, you know, the complexity of our identities, right? Um, and, uh, and, and the incredible creolization and mixture of cultures and languages and histories, you know, uh, thanks partly to colonialism, right? Uh, the underside of creolization, right, is colonial violence and mixing and all, all of those uh, unpleasant things. In terms of Moi and winning the Nobel Prize, I think we, many of us have read him and we all like some of his novels other than, you know, not the others, right? We, we're all very discerning. Uh, readers and um, and I, I don't have a problem with Moyen winning the Nobel Prize, uh, except that his remarks on censorship, uh, you know, that uh, there's no censorship in China, <laughs> you know, was uh, was very much a um, um, something that and so you so you so you do realize that they chose a writer who would be friendly or considered um, you know sort of amenable to the Chinese state, right? Um, and um, I think it would take forever for a Sinophone uh, writer from Hong Kong or Malaysia to win the Nobel Prize. Um, I'm on the Newman Literary Prize Committee, it's not a secret, the Asia Newman uh, Literary, yeah. And, uh, and we're debating these questions right now. Um, and, uh, but I've also always said uh, to my students, the Center for Malaysian Writer, who now uh, lives in Taiwan, his name is Zhang Guixing, absolutely should win the Nobel Prize. <laughs> okay. um, he is a fantastic writer, 
his rainforest trilogy set in the Borneo rainforest uh, is absolutely stunning uh, literary masterpieces. Uh, but, um, you know, he translated part one into English in a very truncated translation, and part one is actually also the poorest of the three because the other two are too difficult to translate. And so they're not available in other, any other language than in the Sinaitic script, uh, which, you know, I'm able to read, some of us are able to read, but not everyone, right? So the politics of translation with the Nobel Prize, right? It's, uh, what's his name, um, Malmquist? Um, yeah, yeah, Malmquist. You know, you just need to be friends with this guy. And he's coming to City U, to the world of transitions. So befriend him. He, he's the Chinese lip person in the, in the Swedish Academy. And lastly, about Bandung and Beijing, uh, 1995, um, you know, that is a very provocative question, right? So how do we understand 1995? Um, I think um, in, in some interesting ways, um, feminism actually, in China, actually took a hit, you know, after, 1995, in the sense that it coincided with the historical moment in China when, uh, uh, you know, uh, women can hold up half the sky Maoist uh, feminism has lost ground, right? And so, you know, the Nguyen Nang Ding Ban Bian Tian no longer relevant. And, and partly also thanks to, uh, I think, liberal feminists in China who have forsaken their socialist roots, right? Uh, uh, the marriage law of 1950 is, um, is one of the most equalizing laws in terms of gender relations in the world, right? Chinese women had equal, legally, supposedly, had equal pay, equal work, uh, plus property rights and everything. You know, of course, it's no property, but what I'm saying is, you know, equally uh, protected under law in terms of employment and, and all of those things. And you know, um, April 6th, the equal pay uh, legislation was struck down in, in the U.S. Uh, Congress. Um, and uh, in the U.S., women still make only 77% of what men make. And uh, I posted this on Facebook. And uh, I'm happy to be Facebook friends with everyone. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, basically translates into, in a woman's lifetime, uh, an equivalent of 445,000 US dollars, which is enough for a woman to pay off a mortgage on a house or to send three kids to the University of California. And uh, so I posted uh, via or uh, evoking uh, Virginia Woolf, uh, who says that, um, you know, we you know the famous uh, book, little book, A Room of One's Own, and that if a woman not only had a room of one's own, or if a woman had equal pay, then she would have not only a room of one's own, but also a house of one's own. <laughs> so, okay. But, uh, but I think the you know, 1990s uh, became a very difficult time for Chinese feminism, right? The Fulian has lost uh, basically pretty much, you know, most of its grounding, you know, and uh, liberal feminism uh, in some ways was on the rise, but liberal feminism could not hold uh, against the tide of uh, you know, neoliberal, uh, primitive, accumulative uh, capitalist forces, you know, that, uh, that reinstate uh, all the, you know, uh, gender, uh, I guess, archaic gender relations and hierarchies back into China, right? Um, and so that's been a very difficult, I think, um, thing for some of us to see, you know, is precisely, you know, how the gains of socialist feminism, which used to be the envy of the world, of feminists around the world, you know, have pretty much uh, been lost. So, yeah, 1995 just does not have the gathering power of Bandung uh, that uh, historically such as very elaborate answers. Now, are the gentlemen in the back and would like to have another maybe two or three? No? Maybe one last question after this gentleman. I'll make my answers short too. Yeah, because that one may be like, <laughs> you have to come. This is a question for uh, maybe younger scholars about the methodology. 
Um, I think uh, I like, or I'm really interested in this idea of using a literary arc, you know, and then that crosses boundaries, crosses borders, crosses time periods as well. But then, how does one choose that literary arc? How does one choose? Does it come out of the text, or does it come from world history texts? And uh, what kind of things should we as young scholars be taking into account when choosing that? Yeah, very good question. We have another question, the very last one. Yeah. Uh, like, in, in my view, uh, as a reader, uh, literature is, is most about aesthetics and about uh, talking about the human, human dramas. And, human dramas? Yeah, dramas um, and all the, the things that all humanity has to endure and, and, and all these like, uh, very deep issues. But uh, I've, I've been perceiving that more and more uh, literature has become, is becoming like a political or gender uh, topic. So in which measure is it important to, to welcome all these other issues that sometimes seems a bit dislocated in this debate about literature. Thank you. So um, I will answer those, or respond to those questions. Um, I have presented this, uh, different variations uh, on this uh, uh, topic, uh, from world history to world literature in different parts, you know, in, in different places. And uh, I have been asked many times precisely the question that you ask. Uh, which is, you know, um, you know, it's all um, nice and easy for you. You're a senior scholar. You can choose and pick, you know, whatever uh, you want to do in some ways uh, because we don't have the pressures of, you know, that young scholars have. Uh, and I'm completely cognizant of that. Um, and, um, and because of these pressures to be more and more expensive in our work, so, if, you know, if, even literary scholars, we can't just work on one author anymore. Remember those days when you can just write five books on one author? You know, or you can write, I don't know, five books on, I don't know, Victorian literature, or five books on, I don't know, we have, of course, hundreds of books on Shakespeare, but, <laughs> you know, or, or, you know, William Faulkner, or, you know, or, or, or whoever. Uh, but, but, but now, it seems like we need to know so much, you know, and, and there's this, uh, this is especially, I think, uh, uh, the case in the U.S. Um, where uh, younger scholars feel they need to really engage with larger and larger sort of uh, uh, frames of analysis, but also, you know, sort of set of, uh, you know, materials. Uh, but I think it's precisely why um, I've, I thought that the idea of the literary arc uh, is much more practical and doable. I'm a very practical person. Than a uh, a kind of more totalizing systemic uh, understanding or or construction of world literature. And uh, what what I mean is that um, we all have our strength and our limits, right? And I think our strength and our limits speak uh, speak uh, powerfully uh, to uh, what we can contribute and what we cannot. Uh, in the context of um, you know, most academic writing, usually if you write about canonical texts, then other people might read you. But if you write about minor texts, they think, oh, how is this relevant to me? And they won't read you, right? Uh, this has always been the problem of why if you write about French literature, suddenly you can become a theorist. But if you write about any other kind of literature, you can never be a theorist. You're just a literary analyst, right, or a textualist. So, so it's it's that kind of sort of a power dynamic within academia that's, you know, of course, you know, it's extremely problematic, and you know, we've been uh, uh, trying to, uh, you know, sort of re refute that and and all all of those things. However, there are different strategies one can use. Uh, one of which is you can mix the canonical text with non-canonical texts, right? And so actually. You, you force the readers to read the non-canonical texts. And, and, and for me, that is a kind of practice of comparison uh, that's ultimately a kind of ethical, responsible way of bringing in uh, minor texts and, 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 and others into the conversation. So there are many different strategies, but that's one. And so with the arc, uh, what happens
happens is that because it is not a, uh, 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 it does not aim for totality, um, it actually allows you to rely on your languages and your, your expertise to uh, bring those texts into you know, a network, into this arc, right? And, and, um, and it allows for scholars working with many different languages, working on many mi minor literatures, to actually, I hope, have a say. Because you can actually bring them in as you would canonical texts, right? Um, it's, and uh, in, in, in some ways, it equalizes the playing field of the power differentials of, 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 of what literatures are supposed to be superior uh, to others. So, um, so I, would, I, would, I would say that uh, you, know, you would still need to use certain strategies to skirt the politics of recognition. Uh, however, uh, the notion of the literary arc as a way of conceiving more literature uh, allows you to actually uh, exploit and, and use your languages and your expertise. And I think we all benefit, right? We all benefit from the multiplicity of languages and, and areas of expertise that uh, you know, different scholars bring into the conversation. And this is actually the, the opening right now because of the popularity of world literature as a, as a, as a paradigm uh, uh, at the moment. And uh, in terms of the relationship between uh, literature and politics, uh, you know, I think uh, we all might, you know, in, in some of our very estate moments, you know, mo mourn the fact that literature is no longer simply uh, aesthetic pleasure, right? But the complicated relationship between aesthetics and politics, right? It's been something that I think it's always theorized since, um, you know, uh, since, uh, since I guess time immemorial, but but you know since the Frankfurt School and and after, um, I think uh, um, I you know I, I don't know whether any statement is not political anymore, um, and but we may use different reading strategies, right? So we might read for pleasure, we might read for aesthetics, you know, uh, pleasure and sublimation, uh, we might read for identificatory, cathartic. Um, you know, sort of experience, uh, but we might also read for politics, right? So, so it's not so much about the essence of literature as much as about, I think, our practices of reading. And so perhaps, you know, we, we take different things uh, from the text and, um, and uh, whether, um, you know, and so, so I would just uh, end there. However, in terms of, and as you, might have uh, you know um, heard about uh, Deleuze and Guattari's notion of minor literature as having always um, uh, always having always needing to be or has to be political, and there are you know various reasons uh, for them uh, to say it, uh, but um, uh, uh, but uh, there is uh, a perceived sense of burden or pressure. Um, minor writers, minority writers, um, in being political or being representative of their community and so forth. So, you know, that's sort of a different, maybe even a different set of conversation, but it's also related. So, anyway, thank you so much for those excellent questions, and um, I look forward to getting more feedback in, um, in casual conversations and other, other, other private conversations. and. Um, and would really love your feedback because you know I'm writing this book, and when you are writing, you know it's like it's just conversation with yourself, and you're so tired of reading yourself and hearing yourself, you know, rather uh, be hearing you and uh, reading you, and I look forward to that opportunity. Thank you so much. today's in-depth professorship's public lecture. So please do join with me to thank Professor Shi by giving her another round of big applause. <laughs> well, I mean, actually, I really like to thank Katie for you know, coordinating this whole event. It's just been amazing. And thanks to Douglas for the fabulous introduction and to Dr. C and of course to the 
you know, to Mr. Chen and family again. Well, thank you. Thank you all for